Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Game Dev Insights. Uh, I'm very happy to host uh, Hernan Lopez today, a game developer with more than 10 years of experience in the games industry and a guy with over 60 games under his belt. Uh, Hernan is also the co-founder of Epic Lama, a multi-award winning uh, company. And um, besides being a great game developer, he's also a speaker. Uh, a casual connect and ambassador in the Latin America and a part of the Argentinian Video Game Developer Association. And in his own words, uh, a terrible magician. So Hernan, yes. happy to have you here. How's it going? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thanks a lot for no, thanks a lot for inviting me to 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 talk about video games. I mean, I really appreciate talking about video games because that's I mean what we do all the time, so it's always fun to talk about. Okay, awesome. That kind of uh, stuff. Cool. So, Hernan, actually, um, what you know, who or what actually inspired you to become a game developer? Well, I think what I, I mean, I really love playing. I think everyone has the same thing. I mean, we all love playing video games. We love a lot playing video games, and uh, at the beginning, I believe. I mean, I, don't, I didn't even dream about making video games because I believed that to make video games, you have to live like in Japan or in the States. Because when you, I mean, I'm from the 84, so we play Famicom games or NES games. And when you finish those, you also saw all that Japanese characters all over the place. So it, it wasn't something that you even dream about. But uh, so I, I like to do comics and stuff like that. Then I realized that uh, a game company uh, came like to to Cordoba, which is my city. And then I realized, hey, maybe I have like a chance to start making games here. So I tried to like join in there. And that was the thing that got me like in the game industry. Yeah, so you love video games, but is there you know, like any like moment you know that like really like solidified your decision you know to become a game developer? You know, like was it you know, like a game or like a talk or you know like uh, a game company coming to Cordoba? You know, I mean, like I, what I, I, actually I, yeah set, set you into in that path? I mean, to, to be honest, when I was when I was a kid, I did I did games. In in paper, like we we like cut like the characters and put it with uh, with a little string and move it in in a cardboard screen and my brother will move the enemies and I will because I mean also they didn't let us play that much at home. We have to get good grades to be able to play one or two hours in the weekend to uh, to so they, make, they that became like a. Uh, uh, positive reinforcement for us video games. So we loved it. I mean, when, when we were able to play all the time that we want and do stuff with it, we, we really, really love it. But also I think Warcraft 3 editor or Age of Empire 2 uh, world editor, or even Duke Nukem uh, editor that was a really, really obscure thing to use. Uh, we with the guys from the neighborhood, we were like doing levels and showing to the, ne the other guys to play them or, or like making our own RTS made in MS paint with paintbrush. Like we do the units and then you can move it with the, the, the crop feature. Uh, and it was like all made up because it wasn't a video game. It was just an image. But uh, that, uh, that's kind of stuff where I think that the first things that we, would, cool. we did that led, I guess, to that passion to making games. But I think it was oh, okay. always there. Awesome. And uh, you mentioned that um, that once this game company actually opened their offices in Cordoba, that that uh, assured you that you that you can you know join the game. yeah yeah I mean, you know actually join the games industry yeah. Can you tell us more about that? Because like I'm not sure you know like how you know. You know, for example, like I do not know that much about what the games ecosystem, you know, like uh, looked like in Argentina while you were growing up, and how you know, and how it like looks looks like now, and how it evolved. Yes, well, when, I mean, that that company was GameLoft. GameLoft was in Cordoba, I guess, in two thousand and four or something like that. It was just a year at that time. 
I was working in a call center, like, uh, you know, like, and uh, what's the problem when you're, with your cell phone, whatever, let's try to fix it. It never worked. I mean, I, I never were able to fix anything, but I worked there. So, uh, and then I, I read in the news that this game company was here. Uh, there weren't many, I mean, the, the game industry in Argentina at that point was just located in Buenos Aires, and it was really, really small. It, it, and the thing is, it, it, we have some games, but we didn't, I mean, it didn't have any coverage. I mean, people didn't know. And I think that in a lot of places that's still happening. Like people don't know that there is a local game industry in their city, in their country. And, uh, and I, I think even here in Argentina, people don't know that they are making like great games. Uh, and they could join the, the game industry, but they don't have any idea that they can join. And that thing seems what the thing that was happening to me. I mean, I never dream about a game uh, to be a game developer because you didn't know that you could have that dream. It was like me being an astronaut, you know, like, oh, and also all those weird preconcepts that you have that to be a developer, you have to know about programming and you have to know about all kind of, of stuff. So when I, when I saw that Gameloft was here, I was like, aha, okay, cool. I will send me send them my my curriculum and and they will hire me for sure because <laughs> because I love video games and I know a lot of video games and and, and it was a really really uh, shitty if I might say so uh, uh, one pager that I sent them and and they and they refused me and I, and they are like they did very well to refuse me because it was a really really but poorly made put together curriculum. For them to to check, it was like, yeah, I, I love video games, and I know a uh, lingo like armor and HP and MP, and I know and I know all these games and this game. Uh, but it's I okay. I from... mean, you didn't know any better. You yeah, know? yeah, I have any idea. It was all from the game uh, player perspective and and the love of, of games. So they they rejected me. So uh, I was like, okay, yeah, it made sense. Uh, let's. I, I would try to do a game to show them that I can do stuff. So I knew how to use uh, Flash at that point, you know, poor lovely Flash that died that we all, yeah. it, it's still on the heart. Three IP, but, yeah. uh, I, so I, I tried to do something there. I, I saw some tutorials and I learned a bit of uh, C++ from a book. And uh, the game that I made, it was just a lot of go to and stop, go to and play and buttons uh, like disguised as characters that you shoot them, but in real life, what you were doing is just clicking buttons and killing the things by clicking them. And uh, so I made this game. And uh, while I was uh, learning about making games in Flash, I stumbled up, up, upon other Flash games. And I realized that those other Flash games, had, uh, uh, they were like really good quality. Uh, and I was thinking like, well, but at that point, I believe that Flash games were free and were made just by fans. But then I realized they have a lot of links and sponsors and whatever. And I was like, hmm, this is, this is maybe taking money from some place. And I stumbled to flashgamelicense.com. That was a page that was like a long time ago that what used to like sell the license of Flash games. And there were a lot of testimonies of people that, yeah, I sold my Flash game through here. I sold from X money and whatever. And I was like, oh, cool, super cool. Let, let's try to. So I made my account. I like uh, tried to join there. I quit my job to, uh, on the call center to be full time making these games to sell on flashgamelicense.com. Uh, I buy a new computer with, the, with, with the, the, the money that I was saving from there to be able to make that game. And, um, and it worked. I mean, after two and a half months, I sold the license and I was like, yeah. I mean, it took me like six months more to like receive the paycheck. And at that time <laughs> you receive a check, a physical check, like a paper one. And, uh, and, uh, yeah, it was like super cool. Uh, then game left close here from Cordoba. I never tried to, I never send them anything, but there, and I started to like, make flash games and sell flash games and make flash games and sell flash games. And that's why I have like a lot of made games because at that point, uh, 
the, the developer cycle of Flash games was super short. I mean, a game that was like, oh, what a long game I made. It took like four months, like, wow, four months for making a game. So much time spent there. There were games that uh, the, I think the shortest that sold the, the that we made was a uh, um, uh, um, dress up games. You know those games where well, there was fashion mm -hmm. pony, which is a pony that you like change clothes of the pony. That was just uh, a drag function over every piece of clothes, and it took me like a day and a half to put together and so like a. Five hundred dollars. Awesome. That for me was like a lot of money. So <laughs> I was so happy there. Awesome! You really, Ran, like you really took like a leap of a leap of faith, you know, like and you know jumped straight into like the deep end of the deep end of the pool, you know, like leaving your job, spending your savings on a on a computer, and you know, just like, I mean, it takes like a lot of I would say you know, like confidence and you know like you know, faith in what you are, you know, faith in what you're doing. Yeah. It's, congrats on that. Yeah, thanks. But I mean, it, it was what I wanted. I, I I didn't have a career. I didn't want to have a career on a call center. So it was, <laughs> I, I saw the opportunity and I tried to take it. I mean, like, it, it was like, okay, I can do this. Let's try to just go for it, you know? Cool. And how this, you know, like, and... You know, moving like from from flash games to PC games, you know, like how does you know how did this tran transition actually actually happened? Okay, I think it was like uh, it makes sense because Flash died, but but we knew that Flash was going to die before it died. Uh, also, when when I was I started like a solo dev, but then I, I like the same friends that I had when I was a kid that I told you that. We made games like in, from Duke Nukem and those editors, they were all from an editor. And I was like, hey, let's join, let's, let's come, let's make games. I mean, this is giving me money and it, and it works. We, we can live from it. So we, we make, a, it was still a small team, three person, but, but, but it was bigger than just one guy. And, uh, and then we started making games and those games were bigger and bigger and a bit bigger. And uh, then we saw the market, the flash market was starting to, to stumble. Uh, it wasn't like we decided like, oh, let's go with Unity because we know that Unity is the future. Because at that point, Unity was another game engine that was out there. I remember they paid you. They paid you $150 if you made any games on Unity. The, the Unity company will pay you just to, to, so they have more games there. And like that, there were a lot of other engine companies that, and their policy was like, let's not do that because we were going to learn something that it's not like proved. But, uh, but then we realized that publishers start to, uh, to adopt uh, the, the Unity engine, that they were like, okay, if you want to do a game for PC, don't do it in Flash, let's do it in Unity because it's easy for porting, for porting games and whatever. So at that point, and when when do the, the the definite transition? I think we do like a a, a mobile game that was part of Unity, and then uh, we were pitching Darkest Darkest Build Castle that was our first point and click big game, uh, and uh, and when we were like looking for publishers, they were like, okay, so you are making this game, this game is in Flash, eh, Flash, eh, it's not dead, but just give me five minutes and. Uh, and then they offer us, okay, uh, we pay for the developer of this game, but please uh, port it on to Unity. I mean, we, tell me how much it will cost to, to do the porting, and uh, you do the porting, and everything is going to be fine. So we did that, and uh, I highly recommend to any new developer, do not uh, try new fancy good sounding engines or technologies in general, because maybe you like uh, adopt Silverlight, that it was also one of those engines that were like going around and he died, or, uh, or you don't find an, an, an audience. You, you try to go with, the, I mean, what we did, and it worked for us, is so you go for the mainstream, and then they're going to ask you to please do it in what is supposed to be the, the, the right engine for it. Mm -hmm. 
Cool. So uh, I'd like to go back to this starting your game studio. You're like inviting your friends to join you. So, um, you know, what actually, you know, like, you know, so how challenging was it, you know, like for you, you know, as, as you know, as a game designer, you know, and, and solo developer to now transition into this role of, you know, like a person who's, you know, running the studio? No matter, you know, like how, you know, how, how small it is, but you know, like what, you know, what, you know, what were like the biggest challenges, you know, you were, you were facing? I mean, there, there are a lot of things that are going on there. Like, uh, first, uh, but uh, I mean, like, uh, needing to, but, but I mean, let me, let me try to, to, to focus on this. At the beginnings, we were like super passionate about making games. And we were like really young. We were 20 something, 24 or something. Uh, so we were taking turns to use the same computer to make games. We didn't have even two different computers in the studio. When we, when one was programming, the other was sleeping in the, in Jeez, the floor. Erda, this is, you know, such, such a good origin story, <laughs> you know. Uh, you know, you know how every like, you know, multi like billionaires, you know, they started from their own garage. You know, you have like the same the same story. Yeah, Starting except from the I, I'm not a and sharing a computer. Yet, <laughs> yet. not yet. The, so my, my story isn't finished. So, so, but the thing is, we would take turns. Like one sleep, the other work. Then, okay, okay, now let me let me keep doing this. Uh, uh, and at that time, we were like, we were extremely full of, of energy and trying to like make games. But with with the passing of time, you cannot keep that level of intensity through the, the rest of the years. And then uh, you have to like uh, start to like making more like a shape of an actual uh, studio or of, of an actual like development team, not just guys full of energy, like, yeah, I'm against, yeah, sure. So I, I think the, the harder part is to try to keep, um, to keep the roles on the, on the game studio on the, and the level of friendship at the same time, and not uh, to be able to care about the other person and to be able to to separate that, maybe not to push that much. Because another thing that happens is like, if, since you are friends, it's not, it's not like you're, and even like you're a business partner, it's not your employee, you're like a partner. So, but this your friend. So it's not something, someone that you don't know and you're thinking, hmm, Maybe I should not, but it's, it's your friend. So you're like, hey, let's do this. And why, the, why isn't this isn't done yet or whatever. This, this kind of like, uh, I'm not sure how to put it, but uh, it's like a, a gray area where you don't know where you're just a dream or you cannot stop talking about work. And maybe other people, it's not interested uh, on the project as you are interested on the project. So you go to your friend's reunion and still talking about, I don't know, beer and the uh, uh, football match or whatever. You just keep talking about work, 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 work. And then you, I think, uh, annoy the hell of everyone uh, because you, you're just talking about the projects and people just, well, it's the weekend. They want to relax and you come with, oh, it will be super fun. We, why we go without this feature? And I was testing the game and you know that here the game is broken. And people don't want to hear that. They just want to relax. Uh, and that thing, uh, I think that's that's something that is troublesome about working with your friends. And I think that also it's troublesome if you are starting a an, an studio, do not start with your friends if you are starting, mm -hmm. because at the beginning you don't have much money. I think a, a lot of, of students sometimes, or when I go to a lecture, they ask me, where will, I don't have any money. Where can I start? And you go, well, if you have maybe a team from college that they are also studying video games, maybe you start with them. So there are a lot of studios that start with a group of friends, but it's, so it's really easy to start with friends. Also friends like are like glue on those, on those moments of, uh, of, of having problems with the projects and are struggling. And I think video games is the making games is all a big struggle until the game is released. Then you struggle more and then you forget about the project. But it's all about doing stuff. And it's always something that is not working quite as you like or something that is happening. 
and the friendship it's it's super cool to like keep the team together and time with friends yes 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 i think that that will be like the the, the, the short answer and the resume <laughs> that you made is perfect <laughs> on point Okay, cool, cool. Um, and uh, Hernan, you know, like you've been doing this for more than for more than ten years. Fifteen, and you know, fifteen. Yeah. Oh, geez, yeah, yeah we. I'm oh, old. Time, time passes. <laughs> yeah, you've been talking about like checks and and flash. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah um, but yeah, you've been like, do, doing this like for for quite some time yes. now uh and you know you've been and of course you know being the being like the indie game developer has its you know has its pros has it has its cons uh but um what has actually you know kept you in you know kept you in your line of you know line of work of being the you know of being like you know being independent you know why didn't you ever like decide to join a big company? Well, in the first place, no one wanted to hire me. No, I'm joking. The, the thing is, <laughs> uh, the, the thing is, I, I really love uh, having like uh, like creative freedom. Let's see, and with this come a lot of uh, good things and a lot of like uh, things you have to deal with. I mean, it, you are like the master of your own ship. And with this, you're also, you are the master of your success, but also of your failure. And you don't have like a net, like you, you don't have a steady paycheck that you will have if you are like in a big company. And uh, that, that the thing that is the downside, on the plus side, you do the games you want to do, you do it at your own pace. You can, uh, you can try to do alliance with, uh, with other studios as you please or as you want. And that is super, super cool. And that's what I, I keep me away from, from joining other company. I think also from, uh, I, I think also it's, a, it's like a, an ego or maybe a pride thing. Like I will do my own company and I'm going to do the best game that I, and I'm going to make. It. I'm not going to join your stupid big ship. I'm going to make my really shitty game, but it's going to be a damn good shitty game. Uh, and I think that, that it, like, it boils down to that thing. Like, it's going to be my stuff. Uh, it's, it's a really shitty answer. But, but I guess, I mean, joining a company is super cool because that's what I see. I see a lot of themes that, that they are, like, uh, lovely, that they made, like, lovely products, big games. Uh, and uh, sometimes it's like, oh, man, I wish I could use that IP. I would love to join just this company to be able to mess with that IP and to use it because I love, because of love of, of that thing or, oh, what a cool project. I would love to just join a bit just to help on that project and then uh, disappear. But then, uh, but then I love to do my stuff and I love the games that I'm making and that we're making now and, uh, and that's it. But yeah, that, that's what I keep, what's that keep me making indie? Being, being in the mm -hmm. making in the games. Cool. And uh, you mentioned that, you know, you are making the game, you know, games that you like. Uh, but I was wondering, you know, do you also, you know, like, so when deciding on like what project to do next, do you also like, you know, do you just like rely on your, you know, inner feeling you know, like you know i i like to play pl platformer games and this is what i want to you know this is what i w want to make or you know do you like do any type of like, any type of you know like market research you know for example like you know you you mentioned you know you've seen that you know flash was going to die and that like unity was actually like the the best next thing you know like and you were you know you mentioned you know some some game engines that you know came but died as well um, so yeah, how do you, my question is actually, you know, how do you decide, you know, what your next project is going, you know, is going to be? Okay. That's a great and fair question to make because I just state, I love to make the games that I want and whatever. And it sounds like I'm just a crazy dude that, that it's like, okay, let's do the whatever. And, and the thing is, and I think that happens to everyone. Everyone would love to make a lot of different games. A lot of them. I mean, you, everyone loves a lot of game genres and uh, would love to put you, the hand, their dirty hands 
in uh, different games. And what you do as a game designer is not that you just do whatever you please. It's like you see first the resources that are available to you. I mean, what people, with which people are you going to work? How, how much money do you have to like spend on making a prototype or a full game or a vertical slice or whatever? And with that, with that money, who can you hire to do that? And also, what is working? What is working for for I mean, what what is what is working for other companies or what is working in the market that could be a game that people will love to play? Like, okay, well, I I like to do let's say uh, another point of view. Okay, well, we have that experience. What 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 players think about it? What of the new point and views that are coming? Which is which is the the age range of that people? What are, okay, what can resonate with them? Do I have the resources to do that? Uh, okay, well, we already made a point and click game, so I have the, for sure we can like, do that again, but we would like to change the artist direction. Do I, do I can hire, uh, let's say, a, a pixel artist that is good to make this? I mean, so you are always checking what team do you have, uh, what is working uh, outside and of course, you have you you have to have a passion to do it. I mean, because again, as I said before, you are always uh, struggling when you are making a game because it's not like drawing where you like start drawing and in five minutes you have like a figure or something that looks beautiful and then you start adding color and more lines and background and then everything looks good, 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 good. It's like making games; it looks like shit all the time and. Uh, yes, yeah, sorry for the for the sorry for the language. It looked bad all the time, and it looked like clunky and doesn't feel right, and it doesn't have music, and the art is bad because it's not there. It's just programmer art, and then the art comes, but it's just hard art in some places and in some places don't. So it looks ugly. So and, and a few months before uh, like uh, releasing, it, you have like a, a game that looks good. And then polishing hits the road. So that two months become like six more months of polishing, polishing, polishing. And then the game releases and you are not satisfied. So you're never satisfied when, when the game came because there is always that you will like to add or whatever. So you have to have a passion for it or it's going to, it's going to be awful uh, during uh, two years, let's say, of development and you don't want to be stuck with a game you don't like for two years. Uh, also, the team should, you have to sell the game to the rest of the team because uh, they, you, they, are, they don't want to be stuck with something they, are, they don't believe in. So, so, yeah, I think that you have to balance your desires with the market desires with the things that you can do because you have that time, that money, and that resources available. And then you're like, okay, well, let's do this. Maybe it's a great decision, maybe it's a terrible decision, but this is the decision you make when making a game. You, you are in love with the ugly thing that you made that looks terrible, but you realize it doesn't look like the final product. You love it because it's your beautiful baby and it's like, okay, in the future, this is going to do good. And then you try to show to someone and that someone, then you realize it's pointless to show to people when it's in the state because they are going to give you all kind of mixed uh, feedback because they are, you're going to be like, no, this is not implemented yet. No, this is not, it's going to be, it's not implemented yet. So you have to show something when it's like looking like the actual game. Usually things feel better when they're already on the point that they have sound effects and the, you, you, you're starting like adding particles and stuff like that, but making the game feel good, it takes time and uh, it has to take time because it has to feel really, really good on the controls and then and, and moving around and stuff like that. So, so yeah, what, what I will say is like always start with a, with a demo, with a short demo. And uh, that is the thing that you're going to be able to show. And then, okay, it's like just development, doing content. But it also takes time to do the demo and do the vertical slice or whatever. So, 
So yeah, it, it, it's not that easy to make gains, but it's not impossible. That's the thing. I mean, if you, if you have the passion and you want to do it, do it. I mean, do games. The only way to learn and the only way to reach to a goal, whatever goal you have, is to do stuff. So you have to uh, do that thing that is going to look awful until it looks good, but just keep your goal in mind and just go like a bull to, to there, you know, I, I go through that struggle and try to reach the goal by just sheer stubbornness, let's say that. Awesome. Uh, and Ran, speaking on like the topic of um, finding publishers and actually acquiring, you know, like budget for development. Yes. Um, what, you know, like what strategies or, or methods, you know, have you found actually effective for finding, you know, for finding these potential, potential pub publishers for your, for your, well, it, it, you know, like, yeah, are, yeah, you know, like, are there like any, you know, special, you know, like platforms or, you know, events or, you know, ways of finding these, you know, people in these, in these places, you know, that can actually, you know, like help you bring, uh, help you bring your game. To the yeah. World. I mean, kidnapping a relative of one of the publishers, that was a good idea to like oh. get money. No, uh, the, the, the thing is like the, to find a publisher, I think the, the first thing that you have to do if you try to find a publisher or a partner or whatever for your game is like, look for games that are similar to yours. Uh, that are really similar to yours, not that the games do you want to be, but what you are. Um, check what companies publish those games. And um, then with your demo, with your demo, with your uh, trailer, and with a lovely pitch deck, you just spam uh, the email folder of them with your game. I mean, like, not spam, but you just send an email, okay, we're X company, we're doing this game, and you think it will fit your portfolio, and you send them those uh, those emails to everyone. Then uh, you ask developers, I mean, in friends that you have, and uh, and it's always good to have like a network of other developers that you can like talk to and rely on, and that's something that I realize is like super cool because it's all uh, your your. I mean, also they are like super cool. I mean, the game com the, the game industry has a lot of like super cool people that you want to like hug and kiss all the time because you make friends like really, really easy because it's people that also love the same things that you love. And uh, and then will they can help you? They can point to like, okay, you know what? I hear that this guy was published by these dudes. Are we looking for something that looks like what the thing that you have? Also. It's super important when you are at that point that you have a demo and you have a trailer, you show your game to everyone, to freaking everyone. You you are like, uh, you, you spam your game, you put it in front of everyone, you're in social media, on, you go, if you are, if you can go to a game industry event that is rele relevant, like it's like a business to business thing that you can go, you go there and you show your game to to, to everyone to, to, to have feedback and maybe they can point you to who is looking for uh, put it in your game on LinkedIn. I mean, when we find publishers through LinkedIn, they like approach to you like, oh, well, you have something that uh, looks like the things that we are looking for and then that develop. Uh, so I will highly recommend to show your game uh, send to relevant publishers that are like that have games like yours. Post everyone and make friends, which is like super fun. And go to events and enjoy the parties. Go to the parties. The more one of the most important things about net networking at game events is not the meets to match feature, which is super cool, but is the is the party. Just go there, make friends, have fun. So. When you are getting offers from yes. publishers, you know, like, what do you actually, um, what do you base your evaluation uh, of, of those offers offers on? You know, like, yeah, can you, like, point us, like, to any, any you know, like, green flags or, you know, like, red flags when it comes to dealing dealing with publishers? Yeah, I mean, I mean, the first red flag is that no one knows the, the publisher it's just uh, these new publishers that no one ever heard about it. And the guy who is talking to you, just 
I don't know, come from a marketing a company that, that that you checked and it, it's just a made up thing or looks like, and you are going to find that kind of stuff. It's not the most common, but you are going to find this kind of like, uh, like publishers that, that are not really offering anything. It's just like, oh yeah, I will publish your game. And what do you bring to the table? I will publish the game. Well, I can also press the publish button on Steam. Uh, but, but why will I want to go with you? Uh, so that will be like the first red flag. So it's, I mean, it's, I'm not telling that new stuff is by default bad, but if the people behind it don't have any track record, just run away from it. And if they don't have any track record and they are also not committing with any kind of upfront uh, payment or covering the development of the game also run the hell out of, from there because they are they, they they are not offering you anything so something that is always at least for me uh, appreciated is when the publisher will take risks like paying for the development of the game or putting money up front for the sales of the game in the future so that thing that they also believe in the game and they are, that also means that they are going to work to recover that uh, money that they already put up front. So that's, I mean, of course, the more track record the publisher has, the better. The more the games that they publish before looks like yours, the better. If the games looks even better, much power to you. But uh, that will be like in super simple terms, uh, of course, always. Ask with your friends, uh, with your developer friends, of course. Not you. But uh, if they know the dude, what's the track record of the company, if there is something sketchy, if it's not, if it's super cool to work with them, or if they know about any kind of like, oh, well, they were, they, they were like, they were like in, in contract, okay, like they did everything by the book, but in the end, I don't know, they didn't help us with the marketing, or it was kind of like, uh, troublesome to war with them because they were like trying to uh, uh, like change creative things too much and that was troublesome or maybe they know it was the, the best experience to go with these guys they are great uh, I highly recommend them okay they always uh, ask uh, other developers who are what cool uh, and can you you know like maybe like share any you know lessons you've learned along the way when it comes to negotiating these contracts, you know, negotiating like the budgets um, and, you know, the overall cooperation, you know, with the publisher, because, you know, more than once we have heard, you know, the stories of, you know, publishers, you know, backing out or, you know, um, lim maybe, you know, limiting your creative freedom or, you know, pushing the dates um, earlier than, than it was, uh, um, then it was agreed uh, agreed on. Yeah, I mean, I'm not sure because I mean, I'm not sure if I can like give you a, a like good info on that because I think that every contract is like uh, a world. Like each contract that you made is like it's going to be different. Try to approach uh, a, a publisher that you know that it's that you hear that it's kind of like more flexible than not because. It, things happen. I mean, the, the, at some point, some weird stuff is going to happen. I mean, uh, you, you, we have a uh, COVID like two years ago and, uh, and that thing changed the way we were working and that stuff that sounds so radical and wild can also appear uh, in the form of other things that you don't expect. Uh, that you that changed the way your team worked, and uh, if you're working with someone that is like like too strict with that kind of stuff, it can be troublesome. Uh, consider expect the unexpected when making your schedule. Like always, have like an extra time for things that can go wrong because they're going to be the things are going to be wrong. I mean, don't be uh, some mm, problem that I see sometimes. Like we developers are like too optimistic. Like, yeah, yeah, we're going to do this in X time. No, 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 I have time to, to, to problems because they are going to be problems at some point. And, uh, and yeah, I mean, always sign something that you are comfortable signing 
don't go blind on just ah oh, money yeah sign and then we check later because that's what when sometimes you, you you stumble upon the developer that don't like the deal that they had with the publisher but then you check the, the contract and the contract says exactly what happens what what ended up happening so uh so don't sign things that you are not agreeing because if you like if you like the money that you're receiving because that's the, the first thing that the developer think about okay okay let me get i mean I, I, everyone now is getting paid that's good we we can like finish this project that i love but then think about the things that also can go wrong that are there in the contract if you don't agree with those bring the, at least talk about them because also think, sometimes I, i talk with developers that don't, they don't even mention that they are not agreeing with this point and this point and this point so if you don't agree with something talk about it and and try to negotiate those points that you're not like may, maybe they, because publisher would try to cover also their asses because they, they i mean they are putting money on something and we are creative people we you know a lot of developers that just leave the industry in the middle of the development cycle they don't feel like making this anymore or they want to change stuff like too much or they change the deadline to a crazy uh, amount of time and of course publishers uh, are going to be afraid of that so they are going to add a lot of stuff to cover about that kind of behavior uh, and we as developers we want to like retain the rights of, of like the of of trying to like if you can like change in the future or make a new ip and you can keep the, the creative uh, rights of the thing so so you always talk about this publishers usually are are are, are cool people i mean they, they want to make money with your game but they are also risking something so talk with them and you're going to maybe find uh, a middle ground you mentioned that you know you yourself can you know press the publish button on steam so you know like what is you know what i'm asking is actually you know, like what is like your advice for you know why is good a publisher you know, and not self publishing like you yeah why go, yeah why, why not, not self publish? publish well the thing is a publisher it's it's i mean has this good things i mean and the bad things like okay they take a share of your profit why don't you uh, keep all that profit yourself uh, and uh, i think that is something super valid to do when uh, you are more experienced i mean but did you say okay you have 15 years why or not i guess you are experienced already but the thing is i'm not experienced at all in marketing I mean, I don't know anything about marketing a game like properly. I I will not know uh, where to put my in, my money on on what to spend to have the game looked for other people. And of course, I I could learn about it, but learning about it will take time of making games. Um, and then these companies exist that the the uh, the only purpose is to make the games rich people and on the other hand they take risk from you to them so you don't want to have risks on yourself when you are making a game because again uh, a lot of things can go right and a lot of things can go wrong so the less risk that you have the better so these companies take from you all the risk of the development backfire let's say you don't make a penny out of the game you're not going to be bankrupt with the, the the debt of paying all the salaries of all the people that help you making make that game also they they have they can help you with things that let's say porting they can help you with porting it's not just marketing localization they can help you with localization oh, of course all the all those things can, you can do it yourself but again it's going to take time for the next game you let's say it doesn't take time for this game that you're making it's going to take time from the next game you're making uh so that's why i highly recommend to work with a publisher or find a good publisher that is willing to take risks with you and uh, that is going to help you on all, on all these fields that you don't want to to take time uh, i know a lot of super successful developers that self published but that also know a lot more of unsuccessful developers 
that self-published and that take them out of the game industry. Because if you uh, take too much risk and things, uh, and our, our, our industry is hit-based, is you're going to do a miss, 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 hit, and the hit is going to cover all the things that you, all the mistakes that you made in the past. But the thing is, if you cannot cover your first two misses, then you're not going to reach that hit ever. So I highly recommend to, to go with the publisher. If you grow, I mean, if you have like a huge audience and a lot of people that are cheering for your games, maybe you can think about, okay, maybe I can like hire someone to help me with this and whatever. But if you're not at that point, publishers are great. Awesome. Thanks. Thanks for sharing that. Um, Erran, also, so um, you've, uh, so yeah, you've, you've spoke about like the importance of, you know, showing your games and, you know, and going mm -hmm. like to conferences and networking in order, you know, like to show your games. Uh, so, you know, how do you actually like prepare, you know, how do you actually prepare for, for a conference? Because you like, uh, I often, you know, when you go to a conference, which has like yes. an indie expo, uh, you know, you run, you know, you run at like indie developers who, uh, you know, like who don't know, you know, how to present their, their game, uh, to, to the audience or, you know, how to talk to, talk to the players, uh, let alone speak with publishers. Uh, so. Yeah, how do you how do you make you know the the best out of visiting a conference? Okay, you know? first thing, have a good sleep before the company before the before the conferences because conferences are a wild beast. Once it starts, you are going to be like on high energy levels of doing stuff until it finished. But you are not going to sleep well. You are going to go go to bed late and wake up early and you're going to be talking with people all the time and you're going to be doing stuff all the time if, if you are like feeling down it's going to be a waste of a lot of opportunities also uh usually uh, game events have lectures and if you are not in a position of learning new stuff because you are showing stuff if you are in the showing your game, don't go to lectures unless it's something super specific that you want to talk with the guy at the end of the lecture. Because if you just, the, the things that they are, or you want to have to ask a specific question to that person and you are waiting for the Q&A, raise your hand, you do your question that, you, that is bugging you. But don't use your time on uh, things that you can see on video later. Uh, use that time that is super pressure that is happening right there to make friends, to check for feedback, to talk with publishers. If you are going to all these lectures, you are not showing your game, you are not making new friends to that can help you in the future or can help you right there, and you are not meeting partners that can help you uh, publish your game uh, to an audience. So that will be like the first things that like you sleep. Don't go to lectures that are not, if you, unless you want to talk with the guy in person. And even so, you can like wait from them outside and stalk them. Uh, also, don't uh, lose time on, on meaningless talks. Like for instance, when you are in a conference, a lot of ads guys, that had no idea about the game industry because it's the first conference that they had, uh, you are going to call to talk with you uh, that you have you have a, a PC game and a mobile ad guy is going to try to schedule a meeting with you to sell the, you the, their stupid ad services that has nothing to do with your game. And if you are polite and you want to, oh, he, he referred to me uh, with my full name, and he said that he liked my game a lot. They say that to every, they, they do that to everyone. Uh, okay, I'm going to talk with, no, you value your time. You don't talk with people you don't, you don't have to talk. You are saving both times, okay? You're, you're being uh, good with that guy who has no idea what, with, with, with whom he might be 
uh, he should be talking to, and you save your time to go and talk specifically with the people you have to. You do your research, check who is going to the conference through the page. They always have a page where there are all the guests are there, and then you should you go check by publishers. Okay, let's see what publishers they are. Okay, this is a publisher. They, they publish mobile games about kitties. My game is not a mobile, not about kitties. Let's skip that guy. And, and you go until you find a few publishers that are aligned with what you are offering, and you try to schedule a meeting with them. Uh, you prepare a pitch. You do your pitch. You listen what they are looking for. You listen what they, are, they have to say. It's not just pitching. It's also like a conversation. Um, and also, you, I mean, it's good to, to go and listen to feedback there. But it's more important to, to do networking. I mean, so you don't, I will highly recommend you to, I mean, if you are a team, and let's say, because what happened is like, uh, if you are in, in, you are from Europe, maybe a more than one person can go with the team there. But if you are for, from Argentina, from Peru or Chile, it's much more expensive to bring a lot of people there. So if you are just one developer wandering around, don't be afraid to leave your game alone and just your cards there and your contact information there, someone to contact, to go for hunt for, for contacts and to show your game maybe just on a video. And if they want to, they go there. But don't keep yourself guarding your game and waiting like a spider to a fly to come to you because it's not going to happen. You, 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 you look at yourself like a working ant that it's like doing stuff. And sometime, from time to time, you go check if someone is playing your game or something happened in your booth, but then go outside. If you are like in, in a conference that is just for the, for the public, not for not business to business, then there, yes, stay on your, with your game, let people play, and then you ask for feedback. And when you ask for feedback, you take notes and you shut your mouth. Because sometimes what I see with a lot of devs, when they are taking feedback, they do this thing when they refute what the other people that just play their game is telling to them. And that's terrible because they are, they are giving you feedback. They are telling you honestly what they think. And even if they are saying something that you don't agree and it's, it's outrageous to you and you hate what they are telling, you shut your mouth, you take the feedback, you let them go, and then you see if you see a pattern. Do you find that, you know, like even like more hel helpful, uh, you know, for your, you know, for your games, for your business, than just being like, a, you know, th then being like, than having you know, like a stand or uh, Absolutely. exhibiting I your mean, game. always. I mean, there are two things that are, that are like super cool about talking about video games. You have to, I mean, I, it's a topic that I love, so I can talk about it. And it's something that is super fun. I mean, and being a speaker in a conference lead you to, for instance, this thing that we are making now, we are keep talking about it. And you help other developers and that's super cool. It's something that I, I really love. But as a career, it's great. I mean, you want to be known. You want to, if you are known, people can refer to you. And if you have the more, the, the more friends do you make, the more it helps you to whatever thing you want to do in life or in whatever career you have, it's always better to be known than to not be known. Uh, you can be invited to new conferences and that invitation already helps a lot because there are new opportunities. I mean, I ended up giving a lecture in China. I will never go to a conference in China because it's exactly the opposite side of the world from uh, my city. In fact, I was like a few kilometers away from the exact opposite point. I checked with, a, with an app. I was like a few kilometers away to be exactly in the opposite side of the planet of my house. Uh, and that gives you new opportunities that you will not spend the time or effort uh, to, to try that, just to see what happened because it, it, it's a lot of money. So, so I will highly recommend you to go 
uh, and if you if you have this uh, passion to talk, I mean, now there are a lot of people that they cannot stand be on stage that they like froze. But if you don't froze, I mean, it's something that you can train, like everything in life. Uh, something, I mean, as a game developer, maybe not in the field of uh, no, no, but in every field. Uh, but especially if you are a game designer or a producer, you have to you have to talk. You have to know how to talk to other people, and all developers will know how to talk to other people. Uh, I mean, like uh, soft skills are super necessary because this is a it's a thing that you make in a, as a team. So it's a great way to 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 practice your soft skills. But maybe for some people, it's pushing a lot. To be like on stage doing magic tricks and talking about your games, but but yeah, it's super super useful to be on the stage and talk about your game. Yeah, I think it's actually like really cool that you have you know like you, that you have like developed this like your your own you know uh, let's call it like a signature. You know, like you're always like doing yeah. actually yeah, magic yeah. tricks, uh, either like yes. on stage or on conference, so people remember yes, that, you by true. that as I mean, well. That, that's something that happens a lot, and people. Uh, remember you as the bearded Argentinian game that barf cards. I mean, that, that's something that, that people like yeah. uh, are know about. Yeah, me. It, it's a picture. That's that's they, like, the guy just barf cards, yeah. or you just do a balloon animal and you give it to someone, and and it, that's something like super super fun, and and it leads you to weird places because people invite you just to. Maybe they don't care about your games, but they care about the, the magic tricks and the balloon animals. And you end in all kind of weird situations that are great for anecdotal purposes. Uh, and uh, you make friends with people that maybe you will not otherwise. And as we stated a lot, the most friends you have, the better. Awesome. Thanks. Thanks, Hernan. Um... Uh, okay, cool. So I just have, you know, like one last question. Um, and that is, you know, like, so yeah, looking back, you know, at your, you know, at your journey as a game developer, um, what, you know, what are like the key lessons that you have learned that you want to, you know, like pass down to, to these like new aspiring, you know, ga game developers, you know, or people looking to join the okay, wonderful first games thing, industry? Do games do whatever you want. i mean if you are an artist do art and do it and, and, and work on that if you're a, a programmer program art program games if you're a game designer design games and and make them not just design them in a paper just download any pre-made game that you can and edit it the way that you you think it will be more fun uh be curious check uh, youtube videos podcast, uh, learn skills, like do the only way that you're going to end in the game industry is if, is, is if you do stuff. I mean, it's super cool to have this knowledge and buy this game design book and go to this lecture and whatever. But if you do nothing, if you just keep on the, okay, I will try to join because I have a lot of all these diplomas, uh, but I don't have any portfolio to show then, uh, a good portfolio is going to kill any uh, paper you, that you have to show. Uh, so, and also because if you like video games, you love to do that stuff. So don't stop and do things. That will be my first advice. My second advice is like, go there. Uh, I think I'll say this a lot, but go there, make friends, meet people, talk, talk with everyone about what you want to do and what you are already doing. If you are doing something, it's always going to be much better. Be, fail, be uh, be ready to fail a lot. As I, as I said, it's, it's all about struggling and stuff, but, but it's like everything that you are starting. I mean, if you are starting whatever thing, you're going to start drawing and it's going to be awful. You're going to start playing an instrument and it's going to be sound terrible. But if you keep doing it and you practice and you, Maybe see a tutorial, but then you do, you try to do it. It's not like you just keep your life seeing tutorials. It's like at some point you have to take the flute and try to play it. So uh, in that sense, uh, do that. I mean, uh, inspiration is much better if you are doing stuff. 